Good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, Nicholas, for this uh, opportunity um, to come and uh, actually for me to, to learn. I and mean, that's why I keep going to school 50 years on, um, is to learn uh, about what are the potential um, unfoldings and possibles becomings of what I've been calling usership in the field of music and musicology. I um, suppose I'm invited here um, because I, amongst other things, a few years ago, about four years ago, as this was four years in the making, published a small book um, called Toward a Lexicon of Usership, which is long since out of print, but is available um, freely, download um, online. Um, and it was a kind of an attempt to unpack some of the uh, so what was at play, what was at work, uh, what was at stake in what I was beginning to see as a kind of a usological turn uh, in contemporary society. Um, and people were in the, in the art field where I come from, people were talking about, uh, were beginning to ask the question, is it possible to talk about art having a use value? Using a, a, a Marxist binary, which Marx always opposed to exchange value. So we know that in the art world, the world of visual arts, that there can be exorbitant exchange values, but can there really be a use value? And posing that question at all uh, appeared to have a kind of a um, Philistine overtones, as if it was uh, the improper question, an impolite question. There was something wrong with that question. It was not the right question to ask. And I was interested in trying to understand uh, why that would be the case and since when. Um, and I wasn't so much interested in use value per se. I wasn't so much interested in an art that was useful. Uh, well, I wasn't disinterested in it, but I was not so much interested in that because I was, as a philosopher, concerned about the potential instrumentalization of a useful art. And anyways, useful for whom and for what and so on as I was interested in a kind of a, a category of relationality, uh, a form of engagement with art and from within art, which um, I called uh, usership. And I was particularly interested in usership, um, and had been over the past uh, 10 years or so, um, because I began to see it as something which was emerging um, as a force to be reckoned with in our society, and particularly in three different ways. Uh, usership seemed, I mean, I should back up a tiny bit. Obviously, usership is not something which emerged 10 years ago. Uh, we've been users of language, primarily, users of tools, users of drugs, users of all sorts of things since, since time immemorial. And uh, there's really, in a sense, nothing new about it, but it began to take on a kind of enhanced, uh, or its, its potentiality um, began to manifest itself with, particularly with the rise of 2.0 culture. Um, so when I talk about usership, of course, a certain understanding links it immediately to the world of technology and user-generated content, user-generated value, user-generated information and the way it's aggregated, uh, often through social media, um, the incredible power that users have when um, using things together. But I didn't see it exclusively uh, in that uh, sense, although that perhaps is what gave a certain kind of currency to the notion. I, I saw it as challenging, the notion of usership as challenging three particularly, I would say, uh, stalwart um, conceptual institutions in modernist society. That of spectatorship in the realm of aesthetics, and I'm going to come back to that for sure, um, because you've also chosen that as one of your two conceptual bogeymen for this um, uh, inquiry of today and tomorrow. Um, towards uh, expert culture in the, in the sphere of uh, epistemology or of knowledge management and production. And perhaps most importantly of all, as a, uh, in a direct confrontational uh, relationship with the extremely and ever more powerful conceptual institution of ownership. So usership is not simply 
um, a kind of uh, ownership, a wannabe ownership or ownership in, um, in waiting, uh, it actually, in its essence and in its structure and in its uh, ways and means, is diametrically opposed to the logic of, of ownership. And by ownership, uh, one translation, the one that I, that I understand you've chosen for this particular um, gathering, is, and one instantiation of ownership is that of authorship. So what I, want, what I propose to do in the next um, few minutes, the next half hour, let's say, um, is to consider a few of the con contemporary manifestations of um, usership in different realms, very different realms. Then, without being overly pedantic or academic about it, to go back into a little bit into the history of ideas to understand uh, why usership remains a kind of minority concept, uh, and in a sense a kind of dissident or a dissenting concept within our um, contemporary configuration. And then I want to um, con consider a few different um, consequences uh, of usership as they may or may not, and that's what I am here to learn about, as they may um, play themselves out in, in the world of music in the expanded sense. Um, all right. So usership is a category, I would say, of political and aesthetic subjectivity and agency. The strange thing about usership is that it emerges exactly there where you would expect it would. And this is the tricky thing that we'll have to keep coming back to. I think it's one of the salient aspects of, of usership as I've considered it over, over a period of time, is that although it appears exactly um, where you expect it, it somehow bursts force, forth in a uh, unleashing a kind of a power that always appears somehow unexpected. Because usership at once, at once activates the space where it is deployed and it repurposes that space. So by using something, you actually make that something active, but at the same time, you repurpose it. You deactivate the use which it had intended. And this, parenthetically, is why, uh, although I think a conference like this is talking about making way for usership, thinking about strategies and tactics to make way for usership. At the same time, that's an inherently and overwhelmingly paradoxical undertaking. Because how would you make way for something which simply happens? You know, like we say, shit happens. Well, we could also say that usership happens. Usership happens, and it happens where we expected it to happen, but in a way that we would never have predicted. And so this, all, all types of, of artistic practices or, or architectures which seek to uh, make way for usership, to, to plan the integration or the participation, the active offering a, a kind of a set of tools um, to users. Uh, this would be the, the challenge, for example, of, of our contemporary institutions, what, what I sometimes call the Museum 3.0, uh, because right now we're operating in a, under an institutional paradigm of 2.0, not just online, not just in social media, but across the board. In other words, the people who go to museums are actively contributing to the value of those institutions. They are actively producing content. They're not simply um, consuming. Uh, they're not simply uh, idly uh, taking advantage of, of something which is offered to them. They are actually um, stakeholders in the production of that value, but they're very rarely remunerated um, we sometimes think it's a, it's a great deal, and this now going back to online culture, we think it's, it's pretty cool that we don't have to pay for YouTube. Well, YouTube's not very cool, but I mean, we think, okay, well, there is sometimes some interesting stuff on there, and you don't have to pay for it. I mean, how awesome is that? But actually, if you, if you think about it, um, why is uh, a, a, a tool or a, a platform like YouTube uh, so valuable? It's valuable because we all use it. That value, when YouTube was, was sold, remember, you know, 10 years ago now, or nine years ago, um, was sold, you know that it was sold at a, at a price that was exorbitantly higher than what it was uh, evaluated by experts to be worth. 
And it's because the calculation was made in a way which was incredibly innovative at that time, is that the price was not based on how much wetware, how much software, and how much hardware uh, YouTube uh, came with, but how many people actually use it. And it turns out the number of people who use YouTube is the same number as people who have access uh, to the internet. In other words, we are all collectively the usership of, uh, of a platform of that kind, without talking about Google and, and, and the others. Uh, and so in a sense, all the value, essentially, which those platforms um, embody, we and we alone have produced that. We, the usership, collectively, globally. And yet, we think it's a good deal that we don't have to pay to. I mean, uh, the swindle is so um, overwhelming that it's somehow invisible. But it's something which is incredibly interesting um, to think about. Uh, the way, for example, uh, reCAPTCHA uh, has aggregated uh, the energy uh, of... Is everyone familiar with reCAPTCHA? Because it's, it's kind of a... I mean, it's, it's an anecdote, but at the same time it's... Um, well, you're familiar with it, even if you don't know you're familiar with it. But it's, it's a telling anecdote, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell and then we can move ahead. Um, is that, you know, um, a few years ago when you wanted to buy something online, um, you would get a kind of squiggly looking word that you had to type out. And if you couldn't read it, then you could click and you get another squiggly looking word that you had to type out. Um, that was called uh, CAPTCHA. And it was designed by a, a brilliant Guatemalan software engineer called Luis Fanan. And it was used to protect um, online purchasing um, from spam. And so it, and the reason it works is because the human eye, um, and there would be interesting ramifications to the, the human ear in the, in the field of music, but the human eye is capable of very quickly, it's not always possible to read that squiggly thing, but the human eye is capable of, of reading something which even now for computers is comparatively uh, difficult to be done with any kind of level of reliability. Um, and so very quickly, well here the numbers are huge because we're talking about social media, every day soon some 200 million users were using um, CAPTCHA for their online purchases. So basically every online purchase came with a, a CAPTCHA feature. So it takes a, the average person it takes them about 10 seconds to solve that problem. 200 million times 10 seconds amounts to a colossal amount of cognitive labor, if you want to call it labor, cognitive usership, but equivalent to cognitive labor. In other words, the biggest factory in the world could not muster that kind of intellectual labor force. So Luis Fanin, the inventor, felt a little bit ashamed. On the one hand, he felt very proud, because he found a tool which the internet could no longer live without. But he felt ashamed because he was wasting 150,000 hours of human brain time every day. And he thought, well, surely we have to protect online purchasing, but surely we could do something more interesting with that than just having people wasting 10 seconds at a time. And so he invented reCAPTCHA, which is still out there, but it's been replaced by ReCAPTCHA 3.0. So you remember that you would get the squiggly word, but then you'd get a fuzzy word too. Well, what was the fuzzy word? The fuzzy word was a word from a book or a newspaper printed previously to 1946, where the type of paper um, contained enough acid that there was a kind of um, smudging or running of the ink. Hardly um, noticeable to the human eye, but making it impossible for um, scanning and, uh, and digitizing of those texts. So what would happen is that they would give you the two, you, if you got the, the squiggly one correct, okay, but how would they know if you got the other one correct, since the whole point was to digitize basically the, all of world literature pre previous in 1946. This was the task that humanity had been set by Louis Fanon. Um, it's not the worst use of our labor, cognitive labor time, but we never consented to it either, um, was to digitize all of uh, literature up to 1946. 
But what they, dis what they determined was that it would take, um, if 10 people got the squiggly word correct and got the same answer for the word, the fuzzy word, then they would validate the fuzzy word because the chances were that it was correct. You think, well, with a protocol like that, it's going to—I mean—it's going to take to the end of time in order to get through uh, war and peace. Uh, well, no, actually, because of the scale of this aggregated usership, of course, uh, books were being uh, news. Entire years of, of newsprint were being digitized every hour. So, I mention that because it raises. Um, a number of, of interesting issues. It comes back to what um, uh, Nicholas and Jonathan said in their, in their um, introduction, is that whereas production and the production reception paradigm in general was one of the key words of modernity and of the 20th century, usership is, although it's often opposed, it's often um, dismissed as a kind of passive category of consumerism is actually entirely different than that. Usership is at the same time production and reception and neither one. Because it points the way, and this is the kind of the, this is one of the political or political economic um, dimensions, uh, utopian dimensions in a way, a kind of a concrete utopia that it embodies, is that it could point the way towards beyond, to, towards the abolition of labor. Because if you can produce value for which you would normally be paid, but for something which you wanted to do anyway, wouldn't that be kind of a one definition of the abolition of labor? And so this is why I think that even in the most trivial um, uh, instances of usership, it remains a profoundly uh, radical form of political subjectivity. But it remains, this is of course in the realm of 2.0, but what about in the realm of, of uh, 1.0? What about in the realm of 0.0, right on the street level? Well, for me, and in my opinion, one of the, the key instances of a, of a usological or a usologically determined um, protest movement is the ongoing uh, yellow vests or gilets jaunes mo uh, movement in France. The gilets jaunes movement be began, and this raises another interesting thing that I want to immediately say about usership, is the Gilets Jaunes movement began as a kind of a categorical movement. It was not a movement of citizens. It was not a movement um, of uh, activists. It was a, a movement which constituted itself around people who, not necessarily through their own choices, were obliged to use the public roadways infrastructure in France and were dependent, after the suppression of most public services and public transport, were dependent on internal combustion engines, which the state policies had encouraged them to, put, to get. And then, uh, with the increase of uh, cost of petrol, um, diesel particularly, um, highway um, fares, tolls, and so on, found themselves uh, incre increasingly in an increasingly precarious position. And so they emerged exactly where their use would predestine them to emerge, at the, at the rond-point, at the roundabouts of the entire country. Using also a device of visibilization, uh, ironically, which of course had been made uh, mandatory for them um, through a bunch of political um, <clears throat> scandals basically around Nicolas Sarkozy whose main campaign contributor was the only authorized producer of the uh, high visibility vests so that everyone had to buy them from him. <clears throat> they immediately became a, uh, a kind of a broad voice uh, speaking not as citizens, not as proletarians, um, but as users of public infrastructure, right? And I think that's a that is, it's not the first time that this has happened. There have been other groups that have spoken out as, as users, but it, uh, it is certainly significant of this ongoing uh, usological moment in which we're in. But it raises another interesting, because every, another interesting issue is that usership is a very double-edged double -edged sword. And we'll see that throughout the, the examples and in the, in the unpacking of some of the, the history of the idea, is that usership is obviously based 
on some kind of uh, self-interest. Uh, it is not based on those uh, grandiose um, concepts uh, so cherished by modernity of uh, the general interest. And this is precisely what is uh, the objection of the expert culture, uh, of, the, of the expert class uh, against, against usership. And, you, and by expert class, I think we can see this as some, something right across the board. Uh, the expert class uh, could be in museums, for example, the curators and the, direct and the directors who don't want to make way or perhaps would like to make way for some kind of mm, controlled usership, but feel that usership by and large is too unwashed a category uh, to be uh, immediately embraced. How do you make way for uh, usership in a museum, for instance, when your role is to show custodianship for incredibly valuable art objects. Because if people use those, who knows what use they will make of them? No. It's a real problem, and making way for usership um, confronts that, that idea, um, in, in a sense, head on. So I come back now to what I was saying at the beginning. Um, I, I was wondering in the realm of aesthetics just why it was that there seemed to be something or even something wrong with talking about usership in the realm of art at all. And I think we've made some inroads here and I think that, well, the fact that a, a symposium or a study day of this kind can be organized shows just to what extent um, the conversation is moving forward. But I can assure you that 10 years ago this could not have happened. It's not possible to have organized in a, in a research institute of this kind a discussion around, uh, around usership of music or in music <clears throat> or in the visual arts. And why not? Uh, why is it emerging now, but particularly why was it repressed before was the question that I, I found myself asking. And in order to answer that question um, after groping around in the dark for a while, I realized that in a way we have to move back about 200 years really quickly um, to the late 18th century, where at least as, as far as the, the visual arts are concerned, and I think to a large extent also uh, the other arts, um, we have to move back to the person who I like to consider as the sort of the uh, the chief software engineer of the project of artistic modernity, which was Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant was uh, an author of uh, three, what are called the three critiques, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and for what interests us here, the critique of judgment. Uh, in the, I'm pinning all of this on, on Kant. It's a little, the story's a little bit more complicated, but for, to move um, forward uh, quickly, uh, we can do it this way is that in, in that, um, that book, the, uh, the Critique of Judgment, Kant was concerned about defining the conditions of possibility of true judgment. In other words, judgment which was not um, simply a subjective preference, but which, which was founded on something um, uh, much more solid, which a kind of a universal um, judgment. And, but he, so he, what he did is that he took the example of art and, uh, because he thought it would be a perfect um, case study if it was possible to determine the conditions of uh, judgment of art. Is this art good or bad or is it beautiful or not beautiful and why? Um, then he might have the model that he needed for other forms of judgment. And so to do that, Kant had to do two things. He had to have a kind of an objective um, definition and a kind of a subjective one. Because art would always be appreciated or judged, evaluated by someone, some subject. But what exactly, first of all, was to be evaluated, to be judged? Well, he had to have a definition of art. And an art had to be different than any other kind of symbolic configuration or configure, uh, symbolic act which existed. And so he defined art uh, as characterized by You've heard this expression before, it's purposeless purpose. It's purposeless purpose. Uh, 
Um, so eine zwecklose Zweck in his, his terms. It's a finalité sans fin. So he didn't say that art has no purpose. Uh, he didn't say art was useless. No, no, no. It's much more sophisticated. Art does have a purpose. Its purpose is its purposelessness. Very clever. Brilliant. Brilliant because, of course, it, um, it inscribes us into a kind of a, of a circularity uh, where art in a society that's ever more hell-bent bent on utilitarian rationality and cost-benefit analysis, we have in art something which has purpose, but it, it's purposeless. Its purpose is its purposelessness. This is the very basis of what would become two huge obsessions of modernist aesthetics, one which was autonomy, because it's, it's a kind of a synonym, or it's a, it's a, a, a prequel to the whole notion of autonomy, which would emerge 100 years later in the 19th century, that um, art must be autonomous because of its purposeless purpose. And another consequence of that is, is its specificity. Art was in this way specific. So the question of its compatibility with other avenues of human endeavor and undertaking was never to be raised because it was a specific, autonomous, and purposely purposeless activity. Okay, so there's that on the one hand. And on the other hand, the, this purposely, purposelessly, purposeless uh, object was destined to this new protagonist which he uh, had emerge in his aesthetic theory, uh, which was that of the spectator, and more specifically, disinterested spectatorship. Of course, disinterested, I mean, it's a ridiculous notion. Of course, in, when you back up a little bit, you, it's, it's laughable. What in the world is a disinterested spectator? But nevertheless, you can see how it dovetails marvelously and perfectly with the notion of purposeless purpose. And those remain, I would say, the cornerstones of the conceptual architecture of our art institutions today. And when I talk about the conceptual architecture, of course, that impacts very directly on the physical architecture, on the place where art as such is uh, legitimated and instantiated for the most part. What Kant did, what he never mentioned was the notion of usership. But when you think about it, that is precisely what was repressed. That was precisely the object of his anxiety was to ensure that usership should never raise its ugly and unmanageable head. So this is why, I think, I mean, well, very quickly, is why it's easy for us to say that we're uh, art lovers or music lovers, but still rather suspicious to suggest that we're art users. We could be drug users, but art users, mm, I don't think so. It, I mean, hopefully, I mean, I'm definitely an art user uh, and a music user, and I, I mean, I would say it in a very, without any kind of complexity, but I think, by and large, if you talk to the directors of our museums and other art institutions, they will be very wary of having their constituency described in terms um, uh, of usership. So the... There's, there's a price to pay for that, of course. So, and in a way, you can understand why those directors of, our, of contemporary institutions are so attached to that notion of disinterested spectatorship because it, and of purposeless purpose, because it kind of provides them with the, the perfect uh, operating uh, paradigm. But it comes at a great expense because it means that art is obliged uh, to fall short on its often uh, overblown, we might say, or it's, but it's often articulated promise to change the world. Its promise to actually be able to, to uh, have traction in the real is of course completely thwarted, thwarted by this um, particular kind of arrangement. Because in the end, yes, it's art, but it's, it's just art. <laughs> 
It's just art, and this argument is regularly trotted out, of course, is in cases of censorship, uh, when autonomy is not respected by public powers and uh, censorship is exerted. The argument, which is regularly mobilized against it, is that you can't do that to art. Uh, 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 you're making a mistake. This is art. Remember art. Just art. Some people say, well, yes, art is the only activity that bites the hand that feeds it, but it never bites very hard, and it never can bite very hard as long as it remains within that paradigm. And I think this is what explains why, over with the, with the failures of the uh, different, the successive waves of avant-garde uh, in the 20th century, why the 21st century uh, began with a kind of um, well, with this usological turn, which I was referring to, where more and more practitioners are finding this is too excessive a price, price to pay um, for the um, for their act, continue their activities under the under the guise of art, and are seeking ways to develop greater traction within the real. In other words, to develop uh, an engagement with a usership rather than that that holy trinity based on artwork, authorship, and spectatorship. Uh, which is constantly triangulating in, in various ways, which was the, the very model of, of art since the Renaissance, they're looking for ways to replace that notion um, with, uh, with notions of a more, a more substantive and a, more, a broader form of relationality, which, is, which I call, in any case, usership. So that's, that's, in, that's in the sphere of, a, of aesthetics. Um, so perhaps you're, you don't hear any resonances with music, or perhaps you do. I'll be interested to hear your, 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 your challenges to, um, to that particular take on things. I move quickly now to the, to the realm of knowledge management, knowledge production, because that there too, um, the last 15 or 20 years have seen a, uh, the consequences of a, use, of a usological turn. Um, as I said, the expert is always someone who fancies that they embody the uh, general interest uh, as opposed to the user, which um, is always seen from the expert perspective, uh, or from the perspective which I call the, uh, the perspective of the, um, the epistemocracy. The epistemocracy, those who govern basically through knowledge. Um, and and I'm, when I say epistemocracy, I do say it with a kind of, in a slightly dismissive way, um, but not entirely because Obviously, they have a point. And if you follow the development of the gilets jaunes, uh, the yellow vests, you can see the, these two positions playing themselves out in a very antagonistic and unreconcilable way. Huh? Because for the expert, the user is always a misuser. Uh, the architect, the star architect, the great architect of the 20th century, the, the uh, the architect that embodies 20th century architect, uh, architecture, said Le Corbusier, had incredible contempt for the, the users of his, of his buildings. In fact, he would have been most happy had there been no one in there. Or if they could have been inhabited somehow by robots, which would not have access to artificial intelligence, that would have no way to repurpose those spaces. Because that's precisely what users do. But there is a kind of epistemic privilege, if you could call it that, which comes from the fact of merely using something. So for example, the person who gets up every morning at 5.30 to take bus number 131 from their home to their place of work knows something about that bus route that the expert who works at City Hall that conceived it after doing any number of case studies and demographic uh, studies and geographic studies and so on, all that and very honest uh, taking into account of the general and the public interest, they cannot know what that person who, who uses it uh, each day could possibly know. Same thing with, the, with, with drug users. Someone who actually uses drugs has a kind of an experience, um, and, and it's a cognitive uh, or an epistemic dimension of experience, which the, uh, the doctor who advises the legislator on uh, prohibiting or authorizing this drug or that drug could never possibly have. And I think that the strongest case um, example of this, uh, maybe it's the strongest case that can be made for usership overall, because it kind of reduces it right down to its very essence, was made by the great philosopher of language, 20th century philosopher of language, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, 
Ludwig Wittgenstein had a very uh, powerful but disarmingly simple um, theory of meaning. Um, and this really speaks to me in a certain way, uh, is that his theory of meaning is that meaning was, was not given in a divinely. In other words, it's not something to which, to which we have no access, but we can only uh, access through the shadow uh, of, the, of the light which it casts but it was something which is there, nor is it something, as Heidegger would have it, something that we could uh, tap into uh, if we could listen deeply enough uh, to, the, um, to the Dasein. No, for Wittgenstein, meaning, all the meaning that there is, that is, all the stability that there is within the world, is determined by the users of language that we are and by us alone. So usership alone determines meaning and ensures what he calls stability through use. Which is why there is, in a sense, no absolute, uh, um, absolute correct way to use language. And this is a, another debate between the epistemocrats and the users of language. The, in, in France, for instance, the Académie Française is constantly um, uh, codifying and um, giving little précis about how uh, this or that uh, piece of grammar or syntax is correct and this one is wrong and why it's wrong and so on. So the, it's an attempt by expert culture to legislate usership, which of course is pure vanity, absolute vanity, because use will be determined by that community of, of users uh, per se, which leads to a, a very important, uh, I think, political consequence, and one which often comes up in debates is that usership is an inherently self-regulating category. As a, as, in terms of political sensitivity. In other words, um, we can say from the lofty perspective of the general interest that um, use must be, uh, this must be used in this way, and this would be an abuse. This is misuse, and this is abuse. Uh, well, that may be true, and we certainly all have our thoughts on that, but actually there is no possible way to uh, control that outside of the sphere of usership itself, ultimately. I mean, you can use, you can lose policing powers, you can use policing powers within the language too, but um, with uh, historically limited success, of course. Um, and so that's that's an important thing to bear in mind. Also, when when we see usership as a kind of agency over in, in, within historical processes, and this leads me to the third category, which is in terms of political economy, the most important, and it's the one that's linked here to the notion of of authorship, which is the opposition of um, usership to the regime, the ever-expanding regime uh, of ownership, particularly within the, within the realms of intellectual property, because there's not much left on the, uh, the, the horizontal surface of our planet that is not owned by someone. Um, but, of course, the, the, now these forms of vertical ownership um, uh, of intellectual property and perhaps at some point of, of individual words and concepts and so on, neologisms and everything is um, oh, up for grabs. The, the, the owning class simply cannot develop the instruments uh, for uh, ensuring stable accumulation fast enough, but runs, up, runs directly opposed to this notion of um, of usership. And in this way, we might think of usership as having a number of historical antecedents, at least this, is, this has been object of my research, is to see usership as linked to such um, uh, activities um, as, as hacking today. I mean, not the kind of, not the way hacking is, is often presented in a mainstream way, but, the, but a, in a kind of a, a sense of um, liberating uh, information from the vectors where it is, um, where its where its flow is regimented and allowing it to disseminate uh, more freely, we might see hacking as the kind of contemporary translation of an activity which is much more ancestral, which is that of poaching, poaching being not killing the last rhinoceroses and elephants in Africa, but the uh, an ancestral uh, activity which uh, by which, under the cover of nightfall, uh, the dispossessed would intrude into the spaces of the possessing classes, make, let's say, uh, make their kill, and then retract back into the, uh, into the commons. Very much the way a sampler would work today, very much the way the 
the way hip hop and rap culture uh, developed around Public Enemy, for example, in the, in the late 1980s and, and, and in the 1990s. Um, the way, in a way, that, the way that folk music uh, has always operated, the way that um, the, um, the Homeric um, epics uh, were, were, were passed on. So where then does this notion of, uh, there'd be a lot to say about ownership, but let's specifically, when it translates to the notion of authorship, where does that notion of authorship come from and why is it, why is it so powerful? Um, and how does it remain powerful when it was the object of almost um, uh, unrelenting um, conceptual assault throughout the 20th century, from the fields of hermeneutics, from the fields of psychoanalysis, from the fields of deconstruction, and so on, post-structuralism, uh, that, that really sought to displace the, the idea of a constituent subject, uh, that, that Cartesian subject, that is the basis of the author. Uh, I think, therefore, I am. Uh, that I uh, was shifted on the one hand to the, sub, uh, the unconscious or the subconscious, uh, shifted to a form of uh, dissemination, dis shifted to a, a whole uh, host of, of uh, competing subjectivities. How is it that authorship emerged from that, um, reinforced, reinforced, and where did it come from in the first place? There was no, this is, Everybody knows this. There was nobody called Mr. Homer who wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? It was a, that was a kind of an author function that was placed there in order to, uh, to limit, to some extent, uh, uh, semantic slippage in every direction. That's the argument, anyways, of, of Michel Foucault. Uh, no, I think that the notion of authorship is uh, un, inseparably linked to the whole theory of what in political philosophy is called possessive individualism. Possessive individualism, which is the, the very essence of, of liberal thought, uh, liberal economic thought, uh, developed in the 16th and 17th centuries uh, around this idea that whatever I am, uh, whatever I can make of myself, well, that's my doing and my doing alone. And therefore, I have every right to sell whatever I can do and whatever I've made of myself on the free market. I became what I am through my own talent or through my own hard work or whatever it was, my good fortune, uh, but without any kind of support from a broader community. That's the notion of possessive individual. In other words, I possess, before any other possession which I may have, I possess my individuality in this sense. And therefore, um, the, well, the consequence of that kind of thinking, of course, uh, we're seeing it uh, more radically every day uh, in, in contemporary society, where, the, where the, the extreme consequences of this liberal thinking are actually being experimented with on the, on the grand scale, is that, for instance, education is an investment and not something which a society should uh, underwrite in order to ensure its own reproduction, as it's always been conceived by every other society in the history of, uh, of humanity, is that now it would be an investment that each individual should make in whatever it is they want to make of themselves so that they can sell whatever that is for a higher price on the market. That's the notion which authorship ultimately is linked to. And I think it's also very significant that at least in the, in the, some, the notion of usership course, is diametrically opposed to this notion of, of um, uh, possessive individualism, but it's also very much linked um, to an idea of co-authorship, because the use which one makes and what one uses, one never is never entirely for oneself. It's always, um, it's that, it's, there's a kind of a notion of using it together. I mean, that notion of um, do-it-yourself, which I've which I'm kind of got in the back of my mind here, do-it-yourself emerged um, basically in the 1950s in, in um, Western Europe and in, and in North America. It emerged at a time where expert culture had, uh, and, and the um, tailorization of the labor process made it so that uh, people who had, had formerly had access to all phases of the production process were being atomized into one very small um, uh, sector of it and had no oversight on the production of things. And so there was this kind of rise of the do-it-yourself movement, the bricoleur, 
uh, all sorts of manuals were made available, and it had that, that thriving success and was, and was much, uh, much triumphed by someone like uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss as being the, the example of a, of a, of a, <clears throat> a non-rational um, scientific society. Um, but I then, then there came this idea in the 19, well, the late, late 1970s with the punk movement, uh, which was, here's a chord, here's a second chord, let's start a band. Right? And so it took that idea of do-it-yourself and added a do-it-together kind of uh, ethos and deployed it in the realm of symbolic production. And so I think that today that the, this notion of usership as it, as it uh, is uh, embodied and uh, experimented with in, in the cultural sector takes on this notion of using it, uh, using it together. Okay, so now, so those are, those are some of the underpinnings, those are some of the, 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 the manifestations in different um, fields. But I'd like to look before I, um, before I sh shut up, um, uh, at some of the, the consequences of usership as I think they might impact on your field because as they've certainly impacted in any case um, on mine. One, uh, one of the most important uh, one of the most interesting things, I think, um, in, in the visual arts in any case, or what's called the visual arts, because often there's not really a very strong visual component anymore, uh, but what emerged from that tradition in any case, is that, well, what happens when uh, art, where the, where the paradigm of spectatorship is displaced and then replaced by the paradigm of usership? Well, one of the things is that the scale of operations changes. In other words, it allows art to ramp up its scale from the reduced scale, which the modernist paradigm uh, um, locked it into, to operate on the one-to-one -one scale. Uh, I don't know if you know this, um, this tale by um, Lewis Carroll. It's quite a quite an interesting one called, it was in a book that he, not his most famous book, but in an 1893 book called um, Sylvia and Bruno Concluded. Uh, and in it, it's, it describes these kind of happy-go-lucky um, encounters between the narrator and his girlfriend and, and different characters. And one of the characters they meet is this, this one called Meinherr, and they start to talk about map making. Um, they just kind of gone from one subject to the next, and uh, the book's quite fascinating. I talked about map making, and, and the question is, well, what would be the largest scale map that would be really useful? The whole thing's all about use, and, and what's useful, and what is use. And, and uh, so they say, oh, you know, about um, oh, 1 to 20. And the mind here says, wow, 1 to 20, you must be kidding. Um, we did like 1 to 10, and then very soon, we went to one to one. We 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 made a, a map of the country on the same scale as the country itself. And the narrator says, "Oh, really? Did did you have you used it much?" And the question of use again. And my narrator said, "No, no, no. It's it's never it's never been unfolded because the farmers uh, objected. They said it would block the sunlight and kill the crops, which." A real lot to say about about the this ecological uh, critique of of map making and how light shedding devices all are light occluding devices. But what's interesting, particularly, is what Meinhof says after that. He said, "So now we use the land itself as its own map, and I can assure you, it does just as well." And so it's a very interesting idea, right? Is because it does not evacuate the question of map making. It simply evacuates the map as an intermediary or as a reduced scale or even a full scale um, uh, interface uh, between the user and what is being used. Use the land itself as its own map. For me, when I read that line, that was a, a perfect description of usership oriented and usership generated practices, uh, which literally use uh, the, the land itself, as it were, as, as its own map. But what does that mean? It's because a, a usership-oriented practice is one which actually engages usership for something which is useworthy. Uh, and so it, well, one thing that happens immediately is that its coefficient of artistic visibility falls through the floor. 
its coefficient of artistic visibility becomes negligible because it both is what it is and an artistic proposition of what it is. It has what I would, was calling in those days a kind of a, you know, in, in those days uh, before I wrote this book uh, and when I was writing it, um, a, a kind of a double ontology. You see what I mean by a double ontology is that it, it has a kind of primary ontology as whatever it is and a kind of superimposed secondary ontology as an artistic proposition of the same thing. It's a kind of a form of redundancy, um, incorporated in that redundancy. So an art proposal, but a proposition. Uh, so uh, what it is and a proposition, a artistic proposition of the same thing. So that has an enormous number uh, of consequences. Um, but why did I talk about a double ontology? Um, and this is one of the things which I've backed off from quite, quite a lot, but there perhaps is an interesting lesson to be learned here, and I'll, I'll just mention it before closing, is that the reason I talked about um, double ontology is because contemporary art theory, in order to distinguish art from what analytical philosopher Arthur Danto calls the mere real thing, uh, in other words, the ready-made from the uh, homologous uh, object that is not art, the difference cannot be based on any perceptual properties because there is no perceptual difference between the land itself and using it as its own map. The difference, though, could not be greater. So the difference can only be ontological from a certain perspective. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a halo which uh, is there and not there, which shines over the, the configuration or the action, the gesture, or whatever. But then you, one might wonder, too, whether these types of practices in withdrawing from the performative frame, in, in withdrawing from the, the, the regime of spectatorship, even emancipated spectatorship, as Jacques Rancière might put it, uh, in order to uh, engage with usership, have actually sought to double their ontology rather than to deontologize altogether. Of course, this is a whole debate in visual arts, usually framed around Marcel Duchamp. Uh, um, but I like to think of this anecdote of Marcel Duchamp playing chess one day with John Cage. And you know that Marcel Duchamp was, an, well, he was number one plus, uh, chess player in France, and he was at one time in the 20s ranked as number seven in the world. So he's a very accomplished chess player. John Cage was a very amateur chess player. But what, would it, what it apparently infuriated Duchamp is that Cage paid no attention to the game. He would just sort of <laughs> move like this. And at a certain point, Duchamp said, but for Christ's sake, John, think about what you're doing, you know. And Cage said, Marcel, it doesn't matter. What matters to me is spending 20 minutes or so in silence with you. So it's a kind of a, a beautiful encounter, this notion that what he wanted, what he was seeking was silence, 20 minutes or so, with Marcel Duchamp. So perhaps, right, we, perhaps, perhaps it's Cage that allows us to shift, the, shift away a little bit. And I think this has tremendous consequences. Perhaps not for you, but I think in the, in the field of aesthetics, the consequences are quite considerable. To shift away from the idea that art has an ontology at all. And I suspect this is what, what Cage was getting at. Is that, um, whereas Duchamp was kind of obsessed with the notion of, of ontology, uh, Cage, I think, could care less. And that seems like a very reckless position to an aesthetic philosopher. Because then how would you separate art? Wouldn't we lose the concept of art altogether? Would it not simply uh, evaporate or be uh, reincorporated back into the world? Which might not be the very worst thing that could ever happen, but it, it, would, it would be of, of concern to an aesthetic philosopher. And Duchamp put this put forth in, in, in one of his, um, S, in a little talk actually that he gave in Houston, Texas in the end of the 1950s, he put forward this idea of a coefficient of art. And by coefficient of art, he said that he meant the um, hiatus or the, the décalage, the gap between um, what was intended but unexpressed and the unintentionally expressed. 
In other words, so when, when anyone sets out to do anything, compose a piece of music or, or, or do a painting or anything, there's obviously going to be a kind of an intention, but that part of that intention will never be realized, and yet something will be realized that was unintended. And of course, it's that gap that, uh, that Duchamp said he wanted to, to define through an arithmetic um, re relationship, which he defined as the coefficient of art. And it's an important thing because, of course, it, it is what means that art is not exhausted in the moment of its emergence, in that, in that flash of uh, emergence into the world, and that it can, be, that it can exist over time and, and be uh, the object of interpretation. But he called it a coefficient of art. That's the weirdest way to describe that, that gap. And so it's almost as if there was something unintentionally expressed in that notion of a coefficient of art, something that was inaudible to Duchamp himself. But something what would have been audible to Cage. What if, for example, uh, in 4 minutes and 33 seconds, it wasn't so much about um, putting this ontological, because performative frame around uh, certain selected uh, segments of time and experience, time space, but if it, was a, it was about saying how much music have we here or there? How much art here or there? What is the coefficient of art of this or this proposition or this or this gesture, this or just action or configuration? So I suspect that that type of um, very relaxed understanding of where music or where art may manifest itself in the world uh, may have considerable implications for art and music um, considered under this, um, this, this usological paradigm. I'll just give you very one quick example, perhaps you already know it. The, the work of, uh, of, a, of a collective called Forensic Listening, uh, which, is, which is a subsection of a group at Goldsmiths, or initially Goldsmiths called Forensic Architecture. And it's, the, it's a sec sector developed by Lawrence Abu Hamdan, um, who has a training, a formal training as a, as a musician, uh, also works as a sound artist, but he doesn't produce sound art. He uses the skills, or what I call the competence, of sound art um, as an investigative tool. Um, because he feels that in our society, which is, is ever more uh, premised on different types of um, not only normatizing, but of, of um, normatized uh, surveillance systems, where accents, for example, are measured by, by state bodies to determine uh, the origin of the person, to determine whether they um, can benefit or not from uh, refugee status and, and so on, where the whole notion of sound has become an incredibly uh, invasive and pervasive, but also potentially um, usership emancipating kind of a tool. So what, so what does he do? Well, I mean, he's done, check it out if you're at all interested in this kinds of things, but like many um, usological practitioners, what he's doing, at least in my reading, uh, like so many of the, of the artists that are the objects, at least of my research, is that he's making a kind of a distinction between um, artistic competence and artistic performance. And I know performance is a huge thing in music, so that's why I dare to mention this. It may seem as a bit of a provocation, but you know that, then, that in the theory of language, uh, or particularly as generative grammar developed by, by Chomsky and that continues on under different names today, there's a kind of a distinction, and it's an Aristotelian distinction, ultimately, between competence and, and performance. In other words, that just by virtue of being a native English speaker, uh, I have what's called a competence. In other words, a competence to recognize um, what is a meaningful sentence as opposed to a meaningless one. Um, it, competence doesn't come, you can't be more or less competence. You, you, you have this competence. But you need never perform your competence in order to possess it. And this, I think, is a key to this usological turn as it plays itself out um, in the arts, is that uh, musical competence, too, um, need not be performed, or need not be performed as music in order to exist at a certain coefficient of music, and perhaps in that way to find um, uh, 
greater traction in the real. So when I talk about um, in the imperformative, uh, or when I talk about the, uh, the deactivation of art and music's aesthetic function, uh, oftentimes this, this creates a kind of jitters among certain practitioners as if there was some injury being made to all that they had premised their creativity upon. But on the contrary, I think it's um, that it's simply an invitation to reconsider where these ideas uh, that we take for granted came from and to enable us, to help us, to take them less for granted. <laughs>